Good morning and welcome to the Prescient Investment Management Equity Update for quarter 3 2023. My name is Sam and today I'm joined by our CIO Bastian and our Head of Equity Cecil. So today we're going to be discussing some of the key themes that we've seen come out over the past quarter, as well as diving a little bit deeper into our portable alpha strategy. So Basti, starting with you, can you give us some insights into where we are in the global growth cycle and give us some predictions for the rest of the year? Do you think that there's a potential for an upswing in equities towards the, towards the end? Yeah, Sam, thanks for having me and thanks for everybody for joining. Um, definitely, so the last couple of months have been very, very encouraging with very strong economic growth, upside surprises in economic growth, which is always good for markets. We have partly priced for that already, so hence um, an equity from equity rally into the year end from these levels is not always that easy. But uh, you are right that we have seen a lot of strong global growth. Okay, so let's start by looking into um, global macro and uh, economic growth in detail. So we use the present economic indicator to understand global growth in real time. We've spoken about that all our webinars previously. Always look into that and what we really want to focus on here is the more recent past where we can see that um, yeah, the US economy in this instance did experience a little bit of a rebound back to almost trend growth and that is very very good because trend growth in the states is between two and three percent. Hence we would not be fearful that we are heading towards a recession. Um, just to reiterate what the present economic indicator is made of, um, always speaking about it, but never really drilling into the inputs. So that's something we want to do today, um, just in one or two of them. As said, we process uh, more than 110 million data points every day at present, and quite a few of those actually find their way into the present economic indicator. Um, I can just unsplit, for example, industrial production data, and you can see that those are all the time series which we would be tracking. And uh, we can do a similar story for like more other real economic variables. So it's a very, very broad array of economic data which we apply, which we scrutinize to understand where the economy is going in real time. If I scroll down and translate that now into GDP growth, as said, it links to roughly two and a half to three percent real GDP growth, which is still very encouraging. So Sam, as you've seen, just generally a lot of indications hinting that we will continue to see a little bit of more growth and that this recession which we've been talking over, uh, talking off over the last couple of months is really not around the corner yet. So what does this actually mean for equities? Okay, so for equities, global growth obviously is a positive. So you want more growth because companies can expand their revenue faster and create more top line with that more bottom line growth and with that higher share prices. So all of that would be positive, but markets are not that easy. There's other factors which we also need to monitor. And we capture actually not just economic growth, but also valuations, financial conditions and sentiment to understand where markets are in real time. Okay, so let's look into our asset views directly and focus on equities and see what our views are. So at the top of the chart, you can see that we are basically mostly on the yeah, more cautious side, not being so positive on equities across the board, mostly yeah, on the moderately negative to even strongly negative side, just neutral on SA equities and more cautious on global equities. As said, global growth is strong, but there's other headwinds. If I dive one level deeper, for example, into the US market, you can see that most importantly, the stretched valuations are really a headwind. And if we basically look at deeper into that, you can see that on any valuation metric which we would apply, there are headwinds. And with that, with that we're not too positive. In SA, we arrive at a neutral view. Just to contrast that, here we actually see more economic headwinds and also suffering from tighter financial conditions. But we see very attractive valuations. Again, if I drill down into the different valuation metrics, price to earnings ratio, price to book ratio, price to sales ratio, and the earnings yield against other markets on every valuation metric, South Africa is cheap. But again, let's not forget about the headwinds. And with that, a neutral stance on SA equities and a more cautious stance on global equities. Thanks, Basti. So it, you're showing that we're quite cautious on equities. And I mean, this month we've seen a resurgence in geopolitical tension with the potential for the conflict in the Middle East to escalate and potentially have global implications. So how does this impact equities? Good question, Sam. So we at present always look at the data. So um, so far, actually, the impact of the conflict on markets has been quite muted. We try to always be ahead of the curve and use forward looking metrics to understand where uncertainty um, for markets is going and where we're at in terms of what markets are pricing for. 
Okay, so we're doing some, something slightly more exotic this time by looking at implied volatility. So that's basically uncertainty priced into markets. You, we're starting with um, our own share market and you can see that volatility hasn't really risen too much. I mean, we have actually not seen any spike on the back of um, the conflict in the Middle East, which is potentially good news. It means that the market is pricing for the situation to remain contained. Obviously, we don't know if that's going to hold, but right now it's not looking too terrible. Okay, another measure of market uncertainty to look at is the implied volatility of the Australian dollar. It might sound a little bit exotic to look at the Australian dollar, but the reason why we're doing it is because the Australian dollar is heavily commodity driven, especially driven by what's happening to the prices of precious metals. So whenever there's a rise in geopolitical tension, you should expect a spike in the implied volatility. So the forward looking perceived level of risk to the Australian dollar. And we can see that there's very, very little risk priced. So the implications of the conflict in the Middle East for markets at least has been muted so far. Thanks, Basti. That's a really interesting way to quantify uncertainty. So we've spoken a lot about inflation in the past. So I want to focus more on the Federal Reserve. The market is really starting to factor in this higher for longer stance. So when can we expect to see the Fed lower rates? Yeah, that's a good point. We have really totally priced for higher for longer by now. Um, the Fed still is slightly more hawkish than, than what the market is saying, but you are right, the market has anticipated rates to be at least higher than previously anticipated. It's still anticipating cuts, but um, not so fast and not so many of them anytime soon. So as always, we like to look at market pricing in detail. The red line is the current effective Fed fund rate, so basically where interest rates are set, short-term interest rates, i.e. the risk-free rate, are set to be. And then the dotted blue lines are basically the pricing of where the market sees interest rates to be. And you can see that we are still anticipating some cuts, but these cuts have now been pushed out all the way down into the next year, actually the second half of next year. Let's see how that looked a month ago. Not too different, so we had the anticipation of I don't want to call it half or longer rates there already, but you can see that we were still priced for much more cuts. But the true gap opens if we look at six months ago, where you can see that we were priced for much, much lower rates and much, much lower rates also being realized much sooner. I mentioned the Fed. So how does the Fed see this? So let's bring in the Fed's median dot. So that's the median of all the Reserve Bank governors to estimate where rates are going to be. And you can see that the FOMC is telling us that over the long term, this is just basically where the Fed anticipates the long term rate to be, um, similar to what the market is saying. But the gap comes into play when we look into the one year dot, where basically the Fed is saying at the end of next year, we'll have probably just one cut, while the market is telling us there will be roughly three cuts. So it's not that big a mismatch anymore, but that's where we see the risk that we continue to price upwards in terms of high rates staying higher for longer. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about interest rates right now. What people now tend to forget, uh, because we're always speaking about higher for longer, is that we also need to look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, because there's something interesting happening here. So if you look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, you can see on the right hand side of the chart that we have actually reduced the size of the balance sheet by a trillion dollars. So that's basically yeah, almost one QE reversed or at least one round of QE reversed. So a lot of quantitative tightening has already happened. And the question is here always obviously also, how will that um, feed through to interest rates? Like when will the Fed slow the unwinding of the balance sheet down? It's just important to focus on that as well because we always speak about inflation, inflation and higher for longer, which are obviously the definitive drivers of interest rates, but the size of the balance sheet truly also measure, matters when it comes to measuring financial conditions. Thanks. So the conversation around global interest rates really does lead quite naturally into our portable alpha strategy. So if we look at global expectations and this higher for longer stance, and rates do stay elevated for longer than expected, what does this mean for the performance outlook of our present equity funds? For present equity funds, higher interest rates are actually good. So for any portable alpha process, you actually want higher rates. It's very hard to explain. In detail, we generally don't like when rates are going up because it means we take a knock on the price because there's duration in our strategies. But once rates are high, that's ex exactly where you want to be because you, first of all, you've got an outlook for rates to come down again, which will then massively push performance. 
and even if rates wouldn't come down and we would, as you suggest, have rates to stay much, much longer for a prolonged period of time, we keep on earning these higher rates against the much lower funding spread. So actually great environment for our portable alpha strategies to be in. It's tough when interest rates go up, but it's very attractive when interest rates are high. Thanks, Basti. So before we go into the intricacies of our portable alpha strategy, let's take a look at the equity market as a whole. So are there any key notable um, themes or um, highlights that we haven't spoken about yet that will impact equity markets? Yeah, quite a few. I mean, we spoke about um, the conflict in the Middle East already, which actually, in fact, um, didn't really move markets that much. China has been a big story earlier this year, and then obviously interest rates being higher for longer. So those are the key drivers. But again, it's a good way to look at it is would be once again to look into volatility. Okay, so we're looking at a, a heat map, so to say, of three months implied volatility. On the y-axis, you can see all the different indices um, which we track on the equity side. And on the x-axis, you see different levels of moneyness, which is basically different, different levels of where the market is pricing options. And then the numbers which you can see here are basically ranged from 0 to 100. So 100 being highest level of implied volatility, i.e. highest level of uncertainty. And a low number would be a 0, basically, or close to 0, would be a very low level of uncertainty. And it's quite interesting to look at it this way when it comes to quantifying uncertainty around equity markets. And we're going to start in Europe. So look at the first three lines, that's the Eurozone. So we're looking at the Eurostox 50, but it's done also directly into the equity indices in France and Germany. And you can see numbers are quite low actually, which speaks to the fact that from a market point of view, the focus on the Ukraine war has actually, um, yeah, I don't want to say disappeared, but been price to a much lower extent. So people are far less worried about Europe right now than they've been earlier in the year. Interesting is um, the index here, the Hang Seng, which is basically tracking China, you can see elevated numbers here still. So basically high levels of uncertainty, meaning that people are still worried about China. Interestingly, we see actually higher numbers on the right hand side than on the left hand side, which means that people are not just worried about downside in China, but also starting to bet on a rebound. So we found that quite interesting as well. Um, so Sam, you can see that I'm trying to basically go through the themes here from a more quantitative point of view. And then technology, obviously still uncertainty around technology. You can see that um, the NASDAQ is priced for elevated levels of volatility. Now you could say that um, there's generally more uncertainty in the tech sector. That's not, well, that might be true. But um, that would be eliminated in this chart because we range bounding the historical volatilities of this index through time. And you can see that the higher numbers here on the downside, so people worried about the downside on the NASDAQ. And then here we've got SA, where there's also still an elevated level of volatility, which is just linking us to global emerging markets. Um, again, then Switzerland and the UK, which is more linked to Europe, we see lower numbers. So the uncertainty is actually grouped around um, China still, emerging markets, potentially technology. And that's also where we basically focus on when we are looking into analyzing themes, analyzing markets more from a thematic point of view. Thanks, Basti. So now, see, so turning to you, how are these dynamics reflected in the positioning of the cover assets within our present core global equity funds, both in developed and emerging markets? And have there been any noteworthy changes to our global um, equity portfolio this quarter? Okay, yeah, thanks, Sam. And um, yeah, thanks to our viewers for tuning in. Um, so, as Basti mentioned, um, the sort of rates being higher uh, for longer is actually quite good for our portable alpha strategy. Um, and looking at the global space, um, the opportunity set, obviously, when rates are high, is is uh, is a lot more uh, in terms of being able to generate portable alpha because we have uh, a lot of assets in the uh, global space that we can use that are exhibiting higher forward yields. Um, the key thing, uh, obviously, is to then balance those, uh, those high yields or this quest for those high yields with a robust risk process, um, which is precisely what we have, and try and come out with a portfolio, a combination of those assets that gives you the best risk uh, uh, adjusted returns.
Okay, so um, as I said, uh, what's required is to balance out the, the risk uh, volatility um, with um, that quest for return. And to do that, um, we, we have our classic um, risk and return um, chart, which shows all the assets um, that we could potentially have as our uh, yield enhancers in the portfolio and their specific uh, volatility on the x-axis uh, versus their return on the y-axis. So what is noteworthy here is that um, we typically fund at around the margin rate, which is around 5.36% at the moment. Um, and as you can see, most of these assets are providing a return uh, because of the high uh, uh, rates, that is much higher than the margin. So simply put, if you if you invested in any of these assets that are higher than this than this dot here, uh, you would be able to uh, generate uh, positive R performance. But as I said, the key is then to make sure that you're not pushing the scale out on the volatility scale, um, which is essentially what this blue um, um, line is. These are uh, the best portfolios for each level of uh, volatility. So the highest returning portfolios, which are made of a combination of these assets for each level of volatility. And instantly some uh, specific assets uh, stand out. So you have high yield corporate bonds, which are giving uh, a yield or forward uh, return of 8.5. Uh, emerging market bonds are as high as 9%. Again, versus 5.36, that's pretty attractive. Uh, but the key thing, again, is that that comes with uh, quite a lot of volatility. And with that being said, um, we then combine this to, um, we combine these assets with the more lower volatility assets, albeit lower uh, return, but to ultimately uh, develop a, a portfolio that has the best of uh, both return and risk. Okay, so if we look at our current um, positioning, um, given this environment of higher for longer, you can see that we have quite a healthy mix of sort of um, lower volatility, lower yield assets, but um, combined with high volatility, higher yield assets uh, to give us a combined uh, portfolio level yield of six, almost 6.8% 6 uh, versus where we're funding, we will recall is just north of 5.3%. So that's a very healthy spread uh, of over a percent, percent and a half um, from uh, combining, from this current allocation of combining these, um, these assets in the global space. Thanks, Iso. So looking at this from a local perspective, how is the implementation of the portable alpha strategy different compared to a global context? Right. Yeah, that's a that's a, a, a good question, one which, which we get a lot. And um, I think it's, you know, this is a good opportunity to, again, contextualize portable alpha and what exactly we're trying to do with portable alpha. The idea is to simply um, be able to generate a portfolio that has a yield higher than whatever the, the funding level is. Um, and to do that, we have a set of assets or universe of assets that we are allowed to utilize. Um, and this is all regulation driven. Um, and what we found in the global space, it's a lot more uh, liberal. Um, so the investment universe available to us is a lot more diverse and a lot more um, broader compared to the local space. Um, but oh, notwithstanding that, the actual principle um, is exactly the same. Um, it's simply the, 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 the environment, uh, the legal regulatory environment um, that, that is, um, is nuanced. So in the local space, for instance, we have to abide by uh, the Cisco regulations, we have to abide by the Pension Fund Act Rec 28 uh, regulations, which are slightly different to the global space where we're of course governed by USITS, but essentially trying to do the exact same thing. So it's safe to assume that the dynamics that influence the strategy are the same when you're looking at global and at local? Yeah, that, that, that is. I mean, from a uh, macroeconomic perspective, uh, the dynamics um, of high inflation, higher rates uh, will, of course, influence your um, your fixed interest instruments exactly the same way as um, as it is in the global space. Uh, and if we look at uh, locally, um, I'll show a, a chart uh, similar to what Bastian showed, but just in the local space uh, to see what the local market is pricing in for rates.
Okay, so if we look at the, the local landscape, um, particularly what uh, the market is expecting for interest rates, it's a very similar chart to uh, the chart that Bastian showed uh, for the US. Essentially, this is the FRA curve, uh, and it shows uh, what the market expects interest rates to be um, in the future. So currently, you can see Jaiba is sitting at 8.34%, um, and the current FRA um, has Jaiba climbing up to 8.53, so just less than a 25 basis point hike. Uh, uh, by February next year uh, before coming down dramatically. So higher for longer indeed, uh, so similar to the to the global space. And if we look at how this has changed, um, it's a lot more pronounced than in the global space. So we can see a clear repricing uh, or a shift of expectations um, upwards uh, compared to what it was a month ago, and even more so uh, compared to what it was uh, six months ago. So again, from portable alpha perspective, um, rates being high, uh, good for the strategy. Uh, rates getting higher, uh, quite painful, um, but um, we're happy to have the higher for longer dynamic, um, similar to the global space, uh, with cuts um, priced in next year, as this is quite favorable for our portable alpha strategy and our positioning. Thanks, Liso. So given this, where are you currently seeing opportunities and how, can the, how are those going to be translated into the portfolio? And what can investors expect to see from performance going forward? Right, right. Um, so yeah, I mean, when we think of opportunities in the in the in the local space, I mean, the first place to start would be to consider whether we want a fixed or floating rate instrument. Um, and uh, depending on what the data is showing us and the likely trajectory of uh, interest rates, um, we'll either go um, tilt the portfolio towards fixed rate instruments, which of course adds a bit more um, term risk or duration risk, um, or if we, we expect interest rates to remain relatively flat then uh, and de-risk the portfolio a little bit, we'll go more floating. Um, currently, as to the second part of your question, where are we seeing opportunities? Um, we, we have a mix of both fixed and, and floating rate instruments that is slightly skewed uh, towards the um, the floating rate instruments, um, and again, that's that's just given um, the likely trajectory and the conviction um, of uh, where interest rates are going to go. Um, and then finally, on the last one, what can expect invest, investors expect uh, from the portable alpha strategy? Um, so we obviously uh, are trying to. Um, have the highest amount of yield relative to our funding costs and we can actually look at that quite comprehensively um, with with this chart. Okay, so if we are discussing what uh, investors can expect from the portable alpha strategy, um, we can have a look at this chart. What this shows is the relative performance, i.e. the portable alpha over and above what the equity markets have done that has been realized till the end of um, end of July. And this has been in an environment where Jaiba has followed this path here. So it was 7.45, went all the way up to 8, and now it's sitting at 8.4 um, and a bit. Um, what, we, what this tool allows us to do is to take the current mixture of our portable alpha assets and um, assume that Jaiba follows this path, which is exactly the path that is implied by the forward rate agreement curve, the FRA curve that we just looked at. And this allows us then to see how much portable alpha, what the outlook is, um, or what can be expected um, if the, the market simply follows what is priced in. And if we do this, you can see exactly, and I'm going to switch these off, you can see exactly how the the path of portable alpha is expected to go like for or over the next uh, 12 months if we hold the exact same cover assets, the same assets that we have now, and the market dynamics play out exactly as as um, as priced in. A uh, few noteworthy things here. So you can see over the last quarter, despite uh, most uh, markets on an absolute basis uh, pulling back over the last quarter, um, the pressing equity funds have actually managed to generate um, performance over and above that uh, equity market pullback, uh, thanks to Portable Alpha and this recovery. And you can see if we look at uh, 12 months out, we're expecting over a percent uh, from the portable offer strategy, um, given the current positioning um, and what is currently being priced in. Thanks, Esau. So just to finish off, let's focus on the realized performance 
um, of the funds. Uh, can you give us some insight into how the prescient equity funds have performed comparing to, compared to their peers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great question. And it's always great to talk about uh, expected performance. Um, but um, yeah, if we look at the, the, the realized performance, the historical performance of funds actually held up quite well, um, despite, um, like I said, um, there being quite a bit of uh, volatility uh, in the markets uh, and shift in expectations. Um, on the Port of Alpha side, we've actually been able to add value, uh, particularly if you look at uh, over the last quarter. And of course, how this compares to peers is that um, we, the Port of Alpha strategy is, or, or the return from the Port of Alpha strategy is on top of what the equity market does. So um, the whole process is uh, based on delivering uh, equity market returns, so whatever equity market index we're looking at, and then uh, having this uh, additional performance from the portable alpha strategy. And if we compare that to the absolute returns of our peers, um, we're not expecting, we never expect our funds to be on either extreme. Um, what, we, what we aim to be is just better than average. And that's precisely what we've managed to do um, over, over uh, the, the historic periods. And uh, we, can show that, um, we can show that with a chart. Okay, so if we look at um, the CISA general equity category um, and where the prescient core equity fund, this is the A2 class, um, currently sits on a percentile rank, you can see this. these are all the funds um, that are in the category uh, or in each of the percentiles. And you can see we're sitting right here in the 57th percentile. And that doesn't sound too exciting, um, but the key again is to be able to do this consistently. Um, and if you do this consistently, then over the longer term, we, we, we will see this, um, this fund move towards the left and to the higher percentiles. Thanks, Lee. So that's really interesting. And clearly, you know, if we're better than average over the short term, we're going to keep drifting into the higher quartiles um, over the long term. Yes. So are there any closing remarks or comments um, before we head to questions? Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, just a, a final closing point is that, um, again, the, 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 the the macro environment and the themes that are playing out and the interest rate environment, um, despite there being a, you know, sort of neutral to moderate underweight on, on equities, our portable alpha strategy simply looks to um, outperform whatever the expected return on equities is. And the current environment is well suited for that. Um, we have high interest rates, which means that the investment universe and the ability to express our view um, is, is much, much more uh, much more pronounced um, and on top of that um, we're having funding rates that are uh, uh, historically low which means that the spread between the rate that we're earning and the rate that we are funding at um, is also historically wide and therefore we can expect nothing but uh, positive outperformance going forward uh, particularly if rates stay high and even better when rates start to come down. Thanks Cecil and thank you Basti and thank you all of you for watching we will now take some questions. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to jump straight in with some of the questions. So, Cecil, to start, mm. how do you control for the historical biases from looking at past data? Right. Um, yeah. So that's a that's a very common question that we um, that we get as a sort of um, systematically driven uh, house. Um, obviously, there are some elements that are quite difficult to pick up. Um, you know, just using raw data, and yes, we do. We do uh, make inferences uh, based on historical relationships, um, and then we compare that with sort of what we're currently observing um, to then make an inference as to what is uh, likely to happen. Um, so, a good example of this could be the the risk indicator um, that we use in our global cover asset space. So. You'll recall uh, from, from um, the chart I showed earlier where we have the risk and return and we put all the cover assets on, on that chart um, and then we draw an efficient frontier um, in order to sort of determine how much risk or how much to push out uh, on that efficient frontier. Uh, we have uh, quite a robust risk uh, uh, indicator. And the purpose of that is to do exactly that, is to try and use uh, historical information and inferences, relationships 
um, and marry that with what we're currently observing um, and then and then make an informed decision. So that that indicator looks at the overall level and um, the slope of credit spreads. So uh, are credit spreads high and are they getting higher or are they high and coming down? And then based on historically what have the, 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 the relationships have been, uh, we then um, marry that with the current pricing and then uh, choose an appropriate uh, cover asset portfolio. So all that to say that, um, you know, yes, we are looking at historical data, but we're also marrying that with what we're currently observing to make, to make a decision. Thanks, Cecil. Yeah. So when measuring uncertainty using market data, mm -hmm. how reliable are the quantitative metrics used to determine volatility? Right. Yeah. So I think I think this question is sort of tied back to, um, you know, the the discussion that Bastian was having with um, looking at um, current uh, implied volatilities. I think he showed there that um, um, if you look at the implied volatilities on the local market or the uh, Australian dollar um, on the back of sort of the geopolitical tensions um, that everything that, that we haven't seen a spike. So um, in terms of reliability, um, I think the, the key thing to consider about that is that these are all forward looking. So when you think about uh, implied volatility, it is what is currently being implied in the pricing that you're seeing. Um, so what can you expect uh, volatility to be going forward? So that makes it um, incredibly reliable because it is, it is a forward looking metric. And um, moreover, if you compare it to um, times in history where uh, there's been a definite spike in volatility and you look to see what that metric has actually done. You'll see uh, in COVID, for example, during the, the global financial crisis, um, there's a, a clear and direct relationship between um, implied volatility and the actual realized volatility. So all in all, very, um, very reliable metrics to use uh, to determine whether or not, um, you know, there is likely to be, um, you know, a spike in, in, in volatility on the back of, of, of um, you know, variables that might not be so easy to, to sort of forecast. Thank you. So we've got two questions here related to portable alpha. So to start with, what is the correlation of your portable alpha to the market in general? Okay. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. The idea of portable alpha is that it is an uncorrelated source of uh, return, i.e. it is not supposed to have any correlation with the actual market. So if you look at uh, whether equity markets are up um, or down, we expect to be able to generate portable alpha in in either of those scenarios. Um, that's 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 the whole point because it is derived from more the fixed income, short term money market space, and because of that, um, we have very little correlation. We actually have a chart um, showing on the um, on the y and the x axis the portable alpha on a monthly basis, and then on the on the other axis showing what the equity market has done so and what we see there is just it looks like a you know a shotgun shell um there's no there's no correlation in any way um and that's precisely what we want from this uncorrelated source of return that you can put on top of your equity market um, equity market beta thanks um and then lastly on the portable alpha side why do increasing rates hurt the strategy when there is supposedly muted duration in the short-term cash assets that are held? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so fair question. Fair question. So, um, the whole idea is to have, um, you know, we're not we're not long on duration um, in the cover assets um, space um, beyond regulation. Um, but even even within sort of the regulatory confines of the of the portfolios, there is still uh, we do still have some fixed rate instruments, um, which will naturally have a sort of term or a sensitivity to uh, change in interest rates. So if you think of a one year NCD, um, which is fixed. Um, if you if 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 you fix uh, I don't know call it a uh, eight nine percent um, yield on a one year NCD and interest rates then fluctuate around that there's going to be a mark to market which will then have a, a, an impact on the portfolio. So despite being in the very short term uh, end of the, the sort of um, 
spectrum, um, there is still some some uh, duration, uh, particularly on the fixed rate instruments that uh, that we still have. And as we said, uh, we're mostly um, you know sort of leaning towards more floating rate instruments. So which means that's how we balance out um, any duration that is um, that is introduced as a as a as a result or consequence of the fixed rate instruments. But there is there is still some sensitivity to interest rates. Um, and I, I, I would add on to that that also just the nature of the 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 sort of instruments and how they how they get marked um, also can introduce uh, interest rate sensitivity. Um, so for instance, we we fund at uh, a three month JABA linked rate. So um, and there's a specific reset periods um, on that leg, um, and depending on how that matches up or marries up to the reset periods on the uh, assets that we invest in, there will be uh, sensitivity to to interest rates and and hence some volatility. But that is all managed and is all part of our uh, part of our um, risk management process. Thank you so much, Cecil. Yeah. Thank you so much to everybody who joined today. I will will hope you have a great day forward, and we'll see you soon.